Hey guys and welcome to Comics and Chill and today we are looking at the Transformers cover art of Pat Lee and Co. So a little while back I made a video about the history of Pat Lee's publishing company Dreamwave Productions. It was a company I was a big fan of theirs. It would have been around the summer of 2003 and I walked into my local comic book shop at the time and I see they've got this you know, big display on one of their shelves full of brightly covered colours and the owner of the store was uh, fussing with them and as soon as he was done I go over to take a look and I just see this like mind-blowing artwork of these giant robots that I was semi-familiar with at the time and uh, the store owner quickly snaps at me and he's like hey, be careful with those he's like I've just finished rearranging the Autobot and Decepticon covers he's like everyone's messing them up all the time every day he was very frustrated about the whole thing. And the covers that I was looking at were Pat Lee's covers for Transformers Generation 1, Volume 2. And when I saw these covers, you know, the characters just jumped right off the page. The, the poses really popped, it was very dynamic. The line work was incredibly tight and slick and the coloring was superb. And there was something about seeing these giant robots in a, you know, snowy battlefield that really caught me. So that really tight and intricate line work combined with the sort of glossy and flat colouring of the characters really contrasted nicely with the more painterly backgrounds which brought the vibe of like a of an animated show to these books. And I think this is something that Dreamwave, the, you know, the Dreamwave gang may have brought over from their creator own books such as Dark Minds where they were trying to replicate the look and feel of anime. And the designs of the Transformers themselves were hyper detailed with all sorts of nuts and bolts and nooks and crannies <laughs> being drawn in, but all contained within these, you know, strong, blocky, classic Transformers shapes, uh, making the characters still pretty easy to read. And this was helped even further by the ultra tight inking of Rob Armstrong, who seemed to apply a sort of uh, halo effect around the outline of each character which allowed them to sort of pop off of one another even in crowded scenes like he would have these you know this thicker black outline around each character. Rob Armstrong as I previously mentioned was a long time inker of Pat Lee's work and James Reyes, Edwin Garcia and a few others you know all contributed whether it was to backgrounds or adding finishes Getting full cover credits for all of these images I'm showing, it was pretty difficult as they are not often featured in the credits of the books themselves, and I was mostly relying on the signatures applied to the art when they were available. Now on the interiors of these books, which I'll review more thoroughly later, Pat's art becomes a bit more frustrating and doesn't hold up to much scrutiny, mainly when it comes to character consistency and sequential storytelling. However, the nostalgic value of these books for me is pretty strong as it brings back a memory of a fun summer trying to collect as many Dreamwave books as I could. Unfortunately, Dreamwave closed about a year after I discovered them, <laughs> but I would constantly scour the back issue bins of my local comic book store to try and find them. And my household or my, my town, but de definitely my house was embarrassingly late in getting the internet, so if I'd known that I could have just bought issues there, I probably would have done that. But you know, there's something fun about hunting this stuff down in person. And I was always trying to learn how to draw, you know, badass robots uh, by looking over the artwork of, you know, Pat Lee, James Reyes, um, Don Figuero. And I was on the Dreamwave website at school all the time, uh, reading their artist submission guidelines over and over, and also trying to cook up my own rip-off robot series with a huge lore, as I knew nothing about the Transformers before this, or, or the lore of the Transformers. But yeah, these covers really did it for me. I mean, the, the colouring was just absolutely incredible. Uh, each cover was pretty intricate, uh, busy group shots. There was a strong sense of scale um, and sort of, you know, believability that was brought to the Transformers, seeing them in these real-world environments. And considering that these were the first Transformers comics since the Marvel Transformers comics, which I believe ended in the early 90s, I think maybe in 94, um, you know, the new sort of digital methods that Dreamwave were using, specifically in the, you know, the coloring, and they would have like sort of um, 
lighting effects that they could do. And as I mentioned prior, sort of pushing the backgrounds back by using a lot of color holes on the line work for them and sort of more painterly textures and keeping the robots up front with this sort of flat cell shaded coloring. It was incredibly dynamic and considering the gap from these comics and the Marvel ones, it got a lot of fans very excited about this series. Anyway, that's about all I got for you today. Um, we do have a new newsletter available, which I'd like to encourage you all to go and sign up to, but mainly the newsletter is there to sort of uh, share what projects I've got coming up. I have a couple of comics that I'm working on myself, uh, ones which I'm drawing and another which I'm writing with another artist. And Lynn, the artwork in that book is incredible. Uh, I'll talk about it more when I can. Uh, and also go ahead and follow us on social media. You know, like, follow, and subscribe on YouTube. We're on Instagram. There's a little bit of action on Twitter. Not much because I'm not much of a Twitter person. Uh, but yeah, you can check us out there. And until next time, take it easy. See you guys.